has a voice. From the slab to your mind's eye. My name is Ron McCarland. After my divorce two years ago, I was left living in a house that was way too big for me. Being there, in that sparsely populated and extremely quiet, woodsy neighborhood, while I was trying to sell it, well, it made for a pretty bleak existence. Then, there came a Sunday night in July, when, around 11, I made the usual trek around each floor, shutting off the lights and trudging up the stairs to go to sleep. In my bedroom, I checked my work email one last time before closing my laptop down to go to bed. I never had much trouble sleeping until Kristen left. Now, sometimes it took me hours or so to drift off. I think it was... About 11.45, when I heard, pretty clearly, a creak on the stairs down the hallway. My bedroom door was closed, but it came to me nonetheless. I tensed up and I lay perfectly still. A few seconds later, there was an identical sound, an identical instance, like a foot on the staircase. I could never fully describe just what that does to you, a moment like that. It felt like my body temperature rose 10 degrees. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. You live your whole life, and then in one second, you learn what it's like for primal terror to swallow you. I waited about 10 seconds more, and I heard nothing. It was a tremendous effort to get out of the bed. I tried to do it without making a sound. I took three quick steps towards the bedroom door, and I slowly depressed the lock button, hoping it wouldn't click too loudly. It was only then that I really exhaled. I pressed an ear to the door. 
Thirty seconds. A minute. Five minutes. The difference between movies and real life is that in real life, I couldn't leave my place. I had to wait it out. There was no line or moment beyond which I felt safe, not after that sound. I didn't dare open the door. There are probably some who think I'm a coward, not realizing what a moment like that truly feels like. It was almost twenty minutes before I moved back to my bed and sat on the edge of it. My cell phone was on the night table, charging. I reached for it and I held it in one hand, muting it so there would be no ringtone if someone were to call or text me. Unlikely in any case. One more sound, and I would make the call to the police. Not for a second did I doubt what I had heard. All that was uncertain was what had caused it. I had no pets. The outer doors were all firmly locked, so I hoped at least. There were two remote possibilities that I could accept. One was that the house was settling somehow due to some recent unpredictable weather. And two, Kristen had somehow come back into the house. But why? Why would she do that? I crossed the room and looked out the window. Only my car was in the driveway. In the end, it was somewhat anticlimactic, just me sitting back on the edge of my bed. For so long, my eyes began to close and I was drawn down into sleep. I lay on top of the blankets, clutching that cell phone. I awoke to sunlight pouring in my window. Even then, I am ashamed to say it took some time to work up the nerve to open the bedroom door. I made two calls to co-workers before I did, and one to Kristen, and worked into the conversation what had happened the night before. Before I left for work, I turned the TV on loud with the intention of keeping it on all day while I was gone, and then I very reluctantly went down into our finished basement. I didn't check around too much, getting a bit nervous down there. Heading out, I realized that my front door was unlocked. I must have left it that way when I had been making trips in and out with the groceries. And so I was pushed even more toward making an awful conclusion. Everybody at the office got the story from me that day, just to make myself feel better really, but when I got home a little before dark my mood had soured completely. How was I supposed to go in there alone and just drop off to sleep like nothing had happened? I sort of hated the people at work who had just listened to my story and empathized emptily. One of them even made light of it. I just wish they could have known what it was like to hear that creak on the staircase just once. When they were alone in the darkness. I worked at my dining room table until about nine, then tried to watch the end of a movie. Outside, there were occasional flashes of lightning in the sky. It was oppressively hot, and we were expecting some thunderstorms, but nothing too serious had developed yet. There was a knock at the front door. I almost dropped my scotch. It shook me so bad. I very reluctantly went to the door and looked through the eye hole. There was a woman outside, mid-thirties, looking pallid in the porch light, which made everyone look that way. It was someone I'd never seen before. I opened the door, but not quite all the way. She introduced herself as Karen, and said she lived over on Grail Street, about eight blocks away, and apologized for the late visit. She had been approached by the person who lived next door to her to start a neighborhood watch committee because of some 
recent incidents people were concerned about. She was talking about prowlers specifically, and I invited her to come into the foyer to let her know that was something I just might have some knowledge about. She thanked me for letting her in. She was on foot tonight and hadn't expected the rumblings of thunder off in the distance. There had been two break-ins that she knew about, both occurring when people were away, and in one case, some things had been stolen. She was fuzzy on the details and didn't even really remember the names of the people who had reported the break-ins. I myself knew none of my neighbors, really. She was using the suggestion of the watch committee to at least get out and know the people she lived close to. I asked her to join me in the living room so I could tell her the story of the night before, and she took off her cheap windbreaker and made herself more at home. She was a little shy, maybe not too comfortable around strangers. She reminded me of what people think of when they think of a cat lady. She was dressed frumpily, pretty much swimming in her old clothes since she was so thin and pale. She obviously didn't think much of herself physically. We sat on opposite sofas, and I told her the whole story of the night before, from the beginning. As I went on, she leaned forward and seemed to be riveted to every detail, though she said nothing until the end. She asked me where my wife had been, so I had to explain about the divorce. Then... She asked me something very strange. She said, if at some point, when I was sitting on the edge of my bed and waiting to see what happened next, if I had sensed something outside my bedroom door, if I had felt a presence of some kind, I wanted to say that, yes, there had been such a point, almost as if I had been detecting someone out in the hallway, presences somehow connecting in the lack of sound and light. But I thought it might have been just intense stress and my body preparing me for a possibly terrifying confrontation. Karen told me she'd had a similar experience once, but had never told anyone about it. She asked me some questions about Kristen, what I did for a living, and how long I'd been in the area. We talked about the neighborhood. She had just rented a room and a house a couple of months before. She wasn't even a homeowner. Twenty minutes had gone past since she'd come in, and I offered her a soda, some water, which she accepted. I went into the kitchen to get it for her, and we kept speaking, calling to each other from our respective rooms for a few minutes while I poured her a Coke and added some ice. The last question I called out to her was about what she did for a living, to which there was no response. I assumed she hadn't heard me. I put the rest of the soda back in the fridge and turned to walk back into the living room. Karen was standing in the entryway to the kitchen, smiling at me strangely. She had raised her hands from her sides up near her head and hooked them into claws in a macabre parody of a monster. She said, I am the thing from your hallway, and nothing more. I laughed it off and made some comment about how I wished it had felt that unthreatening, but she held the position even then, still grinning like an eight-year-old might when trying to creep up on her kid's sister. It was like she was waiting for me to try to move past or laugh more heartily. It was just far too odd a thing to do that it just struck the wrong chord. I stepped forward and held out her soda glass. She took it and without a word turned and headed back into the living room, and I followed. Karen didn't sit down again. Instead, she went to the window that looked out at the woods and stood at it. Still no sign of a rainstorm, though those flashes of harmless heat lightning were still happening occasionally. As if 
Continuing a conversation I wasn't aware had ever begun, she listed for me the names of the pets she'd had as a child, one by one, staring through the window the whole time. It was her long and awkward way of leading into a question about whether I had had a problem with animals running through my yard. I had not. She told me I probably would sometime. She had often mistaken the sounds of raccoons and even deer for intruders. And the woodsiness of this neighborhood meant all sorts of things were running around in the middle of the night. She sympathized with my experience of the night before again and again. I had a casual idea and I mentioned it to her. I said that I'd be glad to give her a ride back home if she'd participate in a little recreation. I was wondering if I took my place inside my bedroom and had her walk up the steps, if I would be reassured that the sound she would make was too different to be what I thought it had been. It was something I genuinely did want to know, even though I already knew the stairs did creak if stepped on the wrong way. It was more a matter of whether the sound could travel that far. She agreed to do this for me, and I was able to use that offer of a ride to telegraph in a subtle way that our conversation had run its course. And so, I set my drink down and pointed her to the staircase curving up to the floor above. I don't think I would have made the suggestion if I wasn't a tiny bit drunk. I moved past her, going ahead, and in doing so, I noticed something new about her. She was wearing a wig. I could see her hairline, and the colors didn't really match. Her natural color was light brown, and the wig was much, much darker. It didn't really mean anything in itself, but I got the sudden inexplicable image in my mind of Karen standing in front of that window in my living room, but in the dark, reaching up, adjusting the wig as she stared out. What had she been seeing outside that window? I had only been in her presence for 20 minutes, but already I felt like I needed to block her out of my life. I told her to come about halfway up the steps and stay there. I said I'd call out from my bedroom, and when I did, I'd like her to walk very, very slowly up the steps, just a few of them. I walked in, and I closed the door behind me. I even sat on the edge of my bed to get as close as possible to that exact position I'd been in when I'd heard the creak. I loudly called out to Karen that I was ready. Nothing happened for a moment. I was just about to call again when I heard the first very soft step. She waited a perfect amount of time, and then she came up another step. The third, after even a longer pause, caused a noticeably louder creak, one that sent a literal chill through me. The fourth and fifth were just like that one, very clear. Even from behind the bedroom door and down the hallway. It was true. It had been someone that night. I would have sworn it at that moment. I got up from the bed and opened the bedroom door. As I did, I was momentarily confused because the light in the hall was different. Sometime after I had gone into my bedroom, Karen had hit the light switch at the bottom of the stairs and she was now half in the dark. Maybe trying to simulate too much, I thought at first. She was standing on the top of the stair now, very still. And she had, for the second time, raised her hands up near her head. The claws were back. That sick parody that wasn't funny at all, just, just childish and inappropriate. Her grin was wider now, and she said nothing. She just stared at me from down the hall, a little off balance. 
like she was trying to remain perfectly fixed for my observation. Like some sinister figure in a wax museum. For the first couple of seconds as I took in the sight of her standing there, my mind didn't register the most striking thing about her position. Not until I noticed her feet did it hit me. She was standing to the far side of the step. She had climbed them by keeping extremely close to the edge nearest the wall, off the narrow strip of carpeting covering the middle of those stairs. It should have been obvious to me when she was on her way up, but why would she have done that? Why would she have known to do that, that only walking on the bare wood would produce that exact sound I'd heard? I hadn't described it in any detail. The person would have just assumed she should go up the center. I waited for her to say something. She just showed her yellow teeth and that awful grin. Her skinny fingers held out threateningly like a monster from a child's primitive nightmare. Why wasn't she asking me what I thought? I nervously muttered some thanks, but I found myself unable to walk forward. Not until I saw how she reacted. She giggled a little, but she didn't lower her hands. I found myself telling her that I had to make a quick phone call, but I'd, I'd meet her downstairs in a few minutes and she could make herself at home. I withdrew back into the bedroom and shut the door without waiting for a response. And for no reason I could fully define, I pressed the lock button on the door inwards, just as I had done less than 24 hours ago. I backed up a few steps and sat on the edge of the bed. I didn't have my phone with me, it was downstairs. I'd long been without a landline. I didn't hear the steps creak again, which would have meant Karen was headed back downstairs. I found myself looking at the bottom of the door, trying to detect a change in the shadows underneath it, meaning movement nearby, but it was too dark in the hallway now to do that. What happened then was a change in the air somehow, a thickening. And I sensed fully what Karen had been talking about before. That sense of presence, that connectedness to someone I couldn't see on the other side of the bedroom door. I held my breath and I leaned forward, my eyes rooted on the crack under the door. When the sound came, I flinched. Karen was twisting the locked doorknob. When she realized she couldn't get in, she spoke. She said that she was the thing from the hallway, come to get me. She addressed me by a name that was not mine, not even close. She had me confused with someone else. She told me through the door that if I wouldn't come out, she would come back when I was less bloody. And those were the exact words she used. Now I heard her moving down the hall. The discrepancy in the volume told me that she tried to be stealthy when she approached. Then, her footsteps on the stairs, softer now, she was on the carpeting. The worst moment, somehow, was when I could hear nothing at all. Even though I knew she was far away from me, not knowing her exact location was just terrible. But then I thought I could hear the front door open, and I definitely heard it shut hard. I quickly opened the bedroom door and went to the railing and looked over it, down into the foyer. There was nothing there. I didn't fully trust that Kieran was gone, though. I moved fast the other way and turned the L corner that led into another bedroom and the guest bathroom across from it. Keeping the lights off, I went to the window in there, which looked out over the front lawn. I saw her down there. She was walking down the driveway. She kept going out onto the road, 
I lived at the end of a cul-de-sac and there was only one direction she could walk. From my house, Grogan Road led on a perfect rising straightaway for almost a half mile. To get back to the intersection that would lead toward the center of the neighborhood, she had a substantial walk. There were only two houses on either side of the road back there where we were all surrounded by the woods bordering a state forest. I could breathe easier now. She was gone, but now I was not convinced of anything she had told me. I felt she might be dangerous. I went downstairs and I picked up my cell phone and I kept it in my right hand as I opened the front door. Karen was almost out of my sight by that time, disappearing down the middle of the street, walking through the dark. Before her image got totally away from me, I went out, intending to follow her just a little ways. I was waiting for some feeling that I should perhaps call the police. I wasn't sure exactly what to tell them, whether I should lie and tell them that I was certain the woman had broken into my home when I still wasn't. I would wait for the smallest sign of indication that I should let my paranoia fully out. I was able to trail her and still keep well enough back that I didn't feel at all threatened. She walked steadily and on a direct path right down the center of the street. She passed the Bowman's house on the left, not giving it the slightest glance. Well up ahead on the right was the triplets. The heat lightning flashed only once in the sky and the air seemed stable, but the wind was strong. I realized when Karen walked past the triplets as well as the turn onto Carnell Street that she had not come from where she said she had. There was only one more house on Grogan all the way in the cul-de-sac on the other end. I didn't know those people, I just knew that they were a married couple. Karen kept on a direct path towards their house when the upward slope ended and we had both crested it. It came into view in the distance. I looked briefly down at my cell phone to confirm it was more or less fully charged. I slowed my pace a little because I sensed myself pulling just a little too close to her and I wanted to keep a good 50 yards behind. On either side of us now were just woods. Maybe I thought she would veer off at the last minute and head into them. Maybe she would get to the driveway up ahead and walk around the house up there, where there was a footpath if you went deep enough into the trees, a trail leading north towards a small park. There was a single light on in the house in an upstairs room. There was one car and the minivan parked in the driveway. I stopped where I was just over the top of the slope that led down towards the house and I watched Karen go towards it. She never moved faster or slower, there was just no variation in her path or her pace. I registered the fact that she was not wearing her black windbreaker. She must have left it in my house. A revolting thought. She walked onto the driveway, past the minivan, and finally turned just to traverse the sidewalk and go up to the front door. She still didn't see me. She knocked on the door and then waited patiently. Someone opened it. It was too dark and too far away to see more than a shape. There seemed to be a conversation, words back and forth, just enough to tell me that Karen certainly didn't know these people. And then the person in the doorway stepped back and let her inside. The front door closed. I was utterly alone on the street. I called the police then. Still feeling uneasy about it, unsure what I would be accusing this woman of, but the feeling I had in the pit of my stomach was undeniable. My call was answered quickly. As I walked very slowly forward, I told the dispatcher that if they had a squad car in the area, 
There seemed to be an unbalanced woman walking the streets, and she had just been in my house. Or I came to think she may have been the night before, trespassing inside it. I said I had just seen her go into an address where they didn't seem to know her. It was very clear that she hadn't committed a crime in my presence, but I was trying to sound as rational as I could. I was told there was, in fact, a car in my area and someone would drive past shortly. I kept walking, looking for signs of life inside the house at the end of Grogan Road. Something that didn't make sense was that no lights had gone on, as you would expect when a visitor is accepted into a home. The front window remained dark. The curtains closed almost all the way. I didn't move closer than the curb, and even then I moved off to one side of the property as if I were out for a smoke near the woods. It took me maybe five minutes to get there, during which time nothing changed. Karen didn't come out. I stood there, feeling an occasional droplet of rain. The wind was starting to get stronger. I heard the sound of a car behind me. Headlights came over the hill. It was the police. They'd come already. When the car caught me in its headlights, I lifted a hand and waved. The officer parked at the curb and got out to greet me. He was a polite, older, crew-cutted guy. I apologized in advance if I was overreacting and very briefly told him a sketch version of the story. He said he would just make sure everything was okay in there and then I could wait at the curb. I prepared myself for mortal embarrassment, but was almost hoping for it now. The officer went up to the front door, making some comment into the tiny mic attached on his shoulder, and he knocked. No answer, in what seemed like almost half a minute. Instead of knocking again, he turned the knob and pushed the door inward just enough to poke his head in. I heard him call out a hello, but I didn't hear any response. He moved completely into the house, not quite shutting the door behind him all the way. There was a point at which I couldn't stay by the curb anymore because he'd just been in there too long, just too long. It couldn't be that nothing should change in eight minutes, ten minutes, but I made up my mind. I crossed the lawn and went up to the door, which was still partially ajar. I poked my head in and listened. Silence. I moved into the dark foyer. Like my own house, this one had a big sunken living room to the right and a staircase to the left. The only light was coming from an upstairs hallway. A hallway that was hidden by the twist of the stairs. That light was the only one I myself left on when I went to bed every night, so that the intruders might think someone was awake up above and not vulnerable. There was not a sound throughout the entire house. Not until a burst of digital noise from above and the voice of the police officer speaking into his radio. Words I couldn't make out. Then, the thump of heavy feet descending the stairs fast, too fast. Before I could even backpedal in fear, he appeared, his gun held outward, ready to shoot to kill, lowering it only a little after determining in a split second that I was not the one in this house who would harm him. Until the other authorities arrived, it was just that man and me in those thick, deep woods behind that house. The officer not allowing me more than a few yards from his side as we tried to spot a single shadow in all that darkness. It was only five minutes until the assistance came, lots of it and I was pulled away from the chaos to be made safe and begin to answer all the questions they had for me. When I first saw the crime scene photographs in the courtroom months later, 
My first thought was just how lucky I had been that night not to make even the slightest ascent up that staircase. And see the blood stains that began just beyond my view from the foyer. It was horrible enough that when the police finally left my home at three in the morning, I realized I had completely forgotten to mention the black windbreaker draped over my sofa. The one that belonged to that intruder. That deeply deranged woman who'd lived less than half of her life outside of a mental hospital. My accidental souvenir that I had the detectives make a special trip to return for. Unable as I was even to touch it, for fear I might get an overwhelming visceral memory of the woman who had made a two-night game of stalking me. Only to unleash her venom on someone even more unsuspecting. Thank you for visiting me tonight at the Radio Morgue. Return now to the safety of the daylight. But remember, as you lie alone in the dark, unable to close your eyes, just keep telling yourself. It's only a story. <laughs> Ha ha ha.